It really just speaks to, again, the capabilities of the man and, and the vision that we all have. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Mr. Chris Hermson, Aurora. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you, too. Good morning. Uh, thanks to, to Mike and Marta and the, the team of Eldine for organizing this today. Uh, it's fantastic to see many from the community uh, that we've been building over the last decade together uh, here today, and it's even better to see the number of people uh, that I don't recognize from outside the community as we're growing it and, and talking about important topics today. I'm going to talk a little bit today about how we think about safety at Aurora and how we think that can be a framework applied across the industry. So over the last 150 years, we've seen the transition from the horse and buggy uh, through, the industrial, or through the invention of the combustion uh, engine to the automobile, through the industrial revolution to the mass manufacture of automobile, through the advent of advanced safety technologies and fe custom features like cruise control, through back in 19, uh, 2007, the, in 2003 to 2007, the DARPA challenges, that brought the first bits of artificial intelligence into vehicles and kind of kicked off the wave that we're riding now to the point today where you know, the recent inventions and advances in deep learning, machine learning are powering our industry and moving it forward. It's a hell of a time to be in the automotive industry and particularly in automated vehicles in that industry. A couple of years ago with a couple of close friends, uh, I founded Aurora, or we founded Aurora together, and the company's mission is to deliver the benefits of self-driving technology safely, quickly, and broadly. And as we thought about that mission, we, we were really very intentional in several of the words in there. The first was benefits, that as a company, and I think as an industry, we need to be thinking not just about the technology itself, but how it's going to be deployed into the world, how it's going to be used to do good. And then for us, we wanted to put safety first. We saw this as, an, as a really essential underpinning to actually getting the, the broader benefits of this technology to market. We think about getting this technology to market quickly. Um, the statistics we all know, 40,000 people roughly in America die every year. Uh, that means that should we, when we ultimately get to the fully safe systems that we hope for, the, the ultimate safety we hope for in these systems, that's 40,000 lives per year saved. And that's, a, that's an opportunity we can't um, waste. And then finally, broadly, that we want technology that isn't just applied for one domain or for one subset of our population, but can be applied across our population and across industry applications. At Aurora, we're building technology uh, where we start with the driver and then we think about the ecosystem around that that can support everything from moving people to moving packages and goods, uh, both short and long distances. But what underpins all of this is a foundation around safety and the, the kind of the, the linchpin technologies that enable that. So I want to talk about the framework we use at Aurora to think about safety, and it really has four pillars. The first is to build a culture and practice a culture of safety, to develop the technology in a way that we think is safe and, and moves the ball forward without putting undue risk during the development cycle, uh, establishing metrics that allow us to have confidence that we have crossed the bar where we can deploy the technology thoughtfully, and then working broadly with, um, with other stakeholders and with the public to educate around why the technology is meaningful and what the risks and challenges we face are. So I'll start first about a pract uh, this practice of uh, instilling a culture of safety. Safety is not one of these things that you bolt on at the end of a process. It's something that you have to be thinking out throughout the process. For us at Aurora, it starts with our core values. One of those is to operate with integrity. We think about the fact we are operating a multi-ton vehicle on the road every day, and ultimately our customers are going to trust us with their lives. That means we have to be worthy of that trust, and we think that foundation of integrity is, uh, is essential to this. And then around that comes the empowerment of the people we have at the, at the company. And so the best, uh, the best way to visualize or understand that empowerment is the process we have around grounding our vehicles. So we test vehicles. Uh, we test them because it's not done yet, and that means that they don't work all of the time, uh, and something comes up. And so we want to ensure that anyone at the company feels empowered that they could say, I saw something that's not quite right, let's bring everything back, shut it down, and understand how we can, how we can do better. A really concrete example for this that, that we saw, which I was very proud of, was one day our operators were out testing a vehicle, and it came to an intersection, and normally in our UI, there's a little icon that shows up that says the vehicle's stopping. The vehicle itself stopped nicely for the traffic light like it was supposed to, but the little icon never showed up. 
And then the vehicle went forward, drove down the next block, stopped perfectly well for the next traffic light. But once again, the little icon didn't show up. Uh, and it's at that moment our vehicle operator said, hey, this isn't right. Um, there's supposed to be a little icon there. Maybe something weird is going on. And so they called a grounding in that moment. And we brought it back. And sure enough, uh, there was a little bug in our UI code. And all the underlying technology was operating properly. But we were able to confirm that, dig in, make sure that we didn't have a bigger issue existing, and then put the vehicles back on the road without putting anyone at, at undue risk. When we think about developing the technology, it is how do we do this in a way that doesn't put the public at undue risk while getting the benefits of this technology in the road? For us, that means a heavy reliance on simulation. So later this year, we're all going to be uh, enjoyed by the media frenzy around the California DMV disengagement report. Uh, and one of the things you'll see from Aurora is that our autonomy miles this year are going to be really quite small. Um, uh, you know, which is entertaining. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot made of it in the press. But the reason why is we put an incredible emphasis on building simulation tools that allow us to get the benefit of it and then verify that the technology works the way we expect it to on the road. And so what you're looking at here, for example, uh, is a simulation, one of the hundreds of simulations we've built around uh, making left turns across traffic, uh, the dreaded unprotected left turn, if you will. Uh, and so this is one of the simulations. Our engineering team was able to work against this offline simulation uh, and the family of simulations like it, get to the point where we had confidence that it would work, and then we were able to put it in practice on the road. And so this is an example of a real-world situation that's actually quite complicated. So sped up a little bit. Um, but if you watch as the vehicle comes to the intersection, first someone runs across the crosswalk late in the light cycle, so we delay for that. Then there's a big gap in the oncoming traffic where it would be really appealing to make the left turn, but a pedestrian has actually stepped into the crosswalk and is making that crossing. The vehicle holds short, waits for the, cross, the pedestrian to cross, waits for the oncoming traffic to cross, and then makes the left turn safely in this type of scenario. And obviously, we have other examples of this, but the key takeaway here is the process of developing offline against simulation allows us to much more efficiently use on-road testing and thus be incrementally safer. The other part of it is that when we take that step from moving from offline to online, uh, we don't just throw it in the car and hope. Uh, we actually have some tremendous uh, vehicle operators on our team. Uh, we do a couple things that are novel. One is all of our vehicle operators are actually employees of the company uh, instead of being contract employees. We think this is really important because these people are out on the road. Really, if, you're going to, if, if the general public interacts with Aurora at this time, Primarily, it's going to be through one of our vehicle operators. So they matter to us. We want them to have an ownership stake in the outcome of what we build as a company and feel that responsibility. And so we have them as full-time employees. And of course, once they get to Aurora, uh, we've screened them pretty aggressively. And then we put them through a six-week, fairly intense training process where we move them first from the right seat where they're observing, ultimately to the left seat where they're piloting the vehicles. The next kind of, I think the biggest question we are facing as an industry is around what is good enough. When we say we want to get to better than human quality, what does that mean? And so at Aurora, we've been putting a bunch of effort into uh, analyzing the available public data sources and digging into those. And so for example, we've looked at um, data from the Federal Crash Registry, uh, and these are different trend lines you can see, where along the bottom of the graph is the significance of the uh, event, so from property damage through to fatality or severity. And along the vertical axis is the rate at which that occurs. And we can pull out different things, like how often does someone get in a fender bender, at least as reported by this database, or in a fatal injury accident uh, running a red light? How often does it happen in general? And if we take the in general data and extract the egregiously bad drivers out of it, what's the rate of failure then? And we can use this and a variety of different other analyses from this to set a bar for ourselves as to where we are, uh, how we're performing relative to the reasonable risk that people already accept on the road, and then use that as a threshold to, to be able to defend that it makes sense to deploy the technology at that point, once we cross that point. And then finally, I think one of the biggest and most important aspects of what we can do uh, is communicate with the public about the opportunity and risks around this technology. 
is something, you know, it's, frankly, it's why I'm here today. Uh, I do enjoy many of you, uh, but the opportunity to, to help tell the story of this technology uh, to the public and help them understand why we're doing it and what the, what the challenges are. One of the things you, you read basically on a bi-weekly basis for a while was that people don't trust automated vehicles. Uh, I think recently the AAA came out with uh, a study that said 71% of people are afraid to ride in self-driving cars. Now I look at that and say that's 29% of the American population who's excited about this, so that's not bad. That's a good place to start. Um, but I want to just highlight a little bit through history um, how some of this has, has looked in the past. So in 2007, the iPhone came to market, uh, and at the time, the reports around it were that effectively this was going to be a bomb. I think it was TechCrunch, who is always savvy, um, and I basically said this is going to be a bomb, and uh, you know, the keyboard was completely useless. Obviously, this has turned into a fairly significant success. Uh, in 1996, Time wrote that the internet was a fad, uh, and that what was it all going to be about anyway? So don't get too excited. Going back a little further to 1890, I'm going to say 1896, um, British Scientific Journal said that the automobile was not really viable because, and I have to, have to refer to the quote here because it was particularly good, uh, because man has not the advantage of the intelligence of the horse in shaping its path, um, which I thought that was pretty fantastic because I think now we're questioning the advantage of the machine's ability to shape its path relative to man. Um, so, so, you know, this is 100 years ago and obviously the automobile has had a very significant impact in all our lives. Uh, and going back even earlier to the late 1400s, uh, there was a monk that basically said that the printing press was useless uh, because it could not produce quality documents of the same way, the, you know, the same quality of the codices that were hand transcribed at the time. Uh, and clearly, that was wrong. Um, and so, you know, when we look at this transformational opportunity in front of us, we have to recognize that it is reasonable that people are skeptical and that we have to be thinking about how do we communicate to them both the opportunities but also the risks of the technology. For me, it really comes down to the, the people involved and that I can understand, um, the mathematical part of me can understand the numbers and the impact that we can have in terms of you know, saving lives in America, saving lives around the world, the incredible economic drag that automobile accidents have on the U.S. economy. But at the end of the day, it's really about the people and the opportunity to make their lives better. When I worked with Google, uh, for several years, we, had a, we worked with Steve Mann. Uh, it turns out he's, uh, he's blind. Um, and for him, getting around is incredibly difficult. He has to piece together different parts of public transit or has to you know, lean on friends to get where he needs to go in life. Um, I get to see firsthand, uh, e even in very limited ways, the impact that automated vehicles could have on his life in giving him back the freedom that we all take for granted. And so I think that's uh, a profoundly important aspect of the work we're doing and is enabled by delivering technology in a safe and thoughtful way. So in summary, I think there are these four pillars that we should be thinking about as an industry uh, and addressing as we work with our stakeholder friends uh, in the public sector. Um, the making sure that we as an industry take responsibility for our actions and have a culture around safety, that we're thoughtful in how we develop the technology, that we have an application for it that will add value to the community, uh, and that we, we take the time to, to not rush it forward to market unreasonably, that we have metrics in place that allow us to evaluate the quality and that we can communicate those effectively, and then ultimately that we work with the public around telling the story of this technology. For me, one of the things that I think is really exciting is that people are not going to buy or utilize AV technology, automated vehicle technology, self-driving cars, because they're safe. They're going to use self-driving vehicles because it's a better experience to get home at the end of the day rather than fighting the 101, sitting back and having a nap or reading a book. They're going to use automated vehicles in cities to provide public transit because it can provide broader access to mobility at a lower price point than the services we offer today. It's going to be used in logistics and long-haul trucking because we have a shortage of labor in that space and, it's, and we have this increased cost of moving goods around through the country. 
But as a society, what we will ultimately get is a benefit in safety because these vehicles will be ever vigilant and they will always be driving kind of at their peak. And I think that is the opportunity in front of us. So I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. I look forward to the rest of the agenda today and thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks, real, real quick, um, and I, I, again, I, I meant it. It's a, it's a compliment because I, I thought it was a bold statement. Your son, did he get a license? No, he did not. Well, what are you going to make him hold out till he's like? Uh, yeah, that, that was it. No, my, so my son turned 16 in the middle of September. For those of you who aren't aware, about five years ago, I said, you know, our aspiration was that within five years. Uh, he wouldn't have to get a driver's license, you know, or when he turned 16, he wouldn't have to get a driver's license. Now, I don't feel too bad about this because I think if he lived in a, a particular neighborhood in Phoenix um, and he was one of the very select few, uh, at least some of the time he might be able to get a ride in a self-driving car. Yeah. Uh, so it's really on us for not living in the right place. Well, and again... So. <laughs> A statement of how quickly it was, and, and again, you had the, the, every right to talk about that with your DARPA background and everything like that. You saw the, the trajectory that we were on, and then uh, and congratulations on starting the new company. So it'll be Thank interesting you. to see how that folds into all of this. So Thank you very much. Well, good to see you, Chris. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you.